The Sony FX30 is probably one of the best cameras that has come out in the last couple of years, and for good reason. It is an incredibly packed camera with a whole bunch of features, stacks up with some of the big dogs, but it's a Super 35 sensor, and uh, we're gonna be talking about 22 main reasons why I love this camera, but we're gonna be talking about three reasons why I don't like this camera. Yes, there's a lot to get through, so let's get into it. Now the first one is Cine EI. Now there are a whole bunch of videos out there of what Cine EI is and how to expose for Cine EI. Essentially, it's just like S-Log picture profile where you can only use the two base ISOs. And to be honest, that's probably what you should be doing anyway, so you can get the best performance out of your sensor. Now when it comes to the two base ISOs, this one is at 800 and 2500, so it's much lower than the FX3, the FX6, and the A7S III, whereas those ones are 12,800, which is crazy high and makes them really, really good at low light. 4K, 120 frames per second in a camera like this is incredible. Sure, there is a 1.5 times crop on top of the Super 35 sensor. So there is a bit of a crop when it comes to 4K, 125 frames per second, but that could be extremely beneficial when it comes to sports and wildlife videographers who need that extra reach. It already gives them that extra reach right there and then. Live stream connectivity. This is really good and very useful if you are live streaming or if you utilize these for your Zoom calls, uh, podcasts, all those kind of things that uh, require you plugging this directly into your computer. You don't need any capture cards, any other additional software. All you need to do is plug this directly into the USB-C, straight into the computer, and you are sweet to go. Loading LUTs. Now you can load your own LUTs onto this camera, which is really great, especially if you do have customized LUTs, if you do have LUTs that you've purchased from other creators, you can load them directly into your camera and get the look directly out of the camera. So you can actually see how you're going to expose according to the LUTs that you're actually loading into. The record button on the front is probably one of the biggest things that uh, a lot of people don't actually utilize. And I find this extremely useful, specifically if you are top handling with right hand, so you don't actually have to go down and press the record button. You can literally press it with your left hand. If you are right-handed, left-handed, over, under sort of style, literally utilize your left hand if you are doing it that way. Otherwise, if you do have your hand onto the grip there, it's pretty much easy to use the top one, but it's there if you need it anyway. The XLR top handle. Now, I actually didn't purchase the FX30 for the XLR top handle, mainly for the fact that I don't actually need to record audio directly into the FX30. And if I do, I'm utilizing the ECM B1M microphone, which slots directly into the multi-phase intershoe. If I'm doing my professional work, I'm utilizing my FX6 anyway. So that one's pretty much got the XLRs into the top handle, which is very similar to this. But if you do record you know, audio directly into here, you can get some professional XLR inputs onto that top handle which makes it so much more versatile than just a regular mirrorless camera. Now this is a video camera that actually takes stills. You can take advantage of the stills mode. Sure, it only does single frame shots, so you can't actually have any sort of burst rates, but you can get 26 megapixel stills out of this camera, which is really, really cool, because uh, when it comes to photography, sometimes you only just wanna take a few product shots here and there and don't need to do any burst photos. If you do obviously need burst photos, this camera isn't for you. It's a video camera. It just so happens to take you know, some stills, which could be great for YouTubers and thumbnails. Gyro data is an incredible thing in the new Sony cameras. And this one actually has the gyro data in here. So essentially, when the sensor moves, the camera is recording how the camera is actually physically moving in the 3D world. It's recording that onto the data, then you can bring it into Catalyst Browse and stabilize this in post. Sure, it does work a little bit better when it comes to boosting up that shutter speed, and you can actually get incredibly gimbal-like videos with this, which it's incredible. And sometimes it is a little bit of a you know tough workflow going into a different app, but Sony have actually capitalized this on bringing Catalyst Browse into Premiere Pro, which is really cool when it comes to these cameras. Dual card slots. Now I know a lot of people don't like the Type A cards because sure, they're extremely expensive, but they have extremely fast read speeds and write speeds. And the great thing is that there's not gonna be any bottlenecking when you're going to be utilizing these cards. They are extremely durable as well. There's no moving parts, it's all 
hard plastic, and they use dual SD cards as well, which you can also get away with. But obviously, the Type A cards will record absolutely every single codec possible. Now, I do have a, uh, a record format video, which actually shows you what memory cards will actually work with which codecs, and uh, I'll link that in the description below. The built-in. Fan. Yes, this thing actually has a built-in fan, just like the FX3. And that is really good if you are recording for long periods of time in extreme heats, which is really great here in Australia because it's 37 degrees outside, 37 degrees Celsius, which is really hot. It's not incredibly hot, it's not in the 40s at the moment, but hopefully it won't get to the 40s, but 37 degrees, it's crazy hot. But this thing is great for interviews because you can literally sit on a tripod and not have to worry about it overheating, which I know a lot of Sony cameras in the past have had flack for overheating. Some of the Canon cameras have had flack for overheating, but that's what these professional cinema cameras are for because they have a fan. They are pretty much reliable when it comes to professional work. The All Icodec N RAW recording. Yes, this camera can actually record RAW. Sure, it's through the Atomos Ninja 5 and uh, it's pretty much the same with all the other Sony Act cameras that are capable of recording in RAW, which gives you, you know, flexibility in terms of white balance and all those kind of things. Not as much as like, real raw, but it's still a really good option to have anyway. Now this one does have all eye codecs as well, so it's not just compressed footage like some of the Canon cameras have. Some of the Canon smaller end cameras don't actually utilize the uh, all eye codec. They pretty much have IPB, which is your compressed raw, which this one has all eye codec. 240 frames per second in HD. That is incredibly good for a camera like this, but it's one of those things that you don't really use very often. But if you do really need it, you know, it is there to use. But you do have to utilize that in S and Q mode if you want to get the most out of it as well. Time code in. Now this one does accept time code in, which is obviously really good if you are syncing and pairing cameras with your audio together in post-production. This can pretty much be the difference between getting a job and not getting a job because time code can be extremely important on professional sets. A lot of larger cameras will have that specific port there for time code, but this one goes through directly uh, into the camera and that's great obviously for your professional use. Now, Canon have been hitting this one for quite a while, and that is full-size HDMI. <laughs> Some Canon cameras still have the micro HDMI, which uh, Sony got rid of when it came to all the other Sony A6000 uh, style cameras, and this one has full-size HDMI. It's much thicker, it's much more durable, and you're not going to be breaking it, which is great. Obviously, it's not SDI like the FX6, but hey, Full-size HDMI is extremely good in a camera like this. As I was talking about before, I don't have the XLR top handle, but I do use the ECM B1M, which is Sony's microphone that fits directly into the hot shoe. Now this hot shoe is the multi-interface shoe, which is one of the best features that I love about all the new Sony cameras because the a7 IV has it, my FX6 has it, and obviously this FX30 has it as well, which is great because you can have a microphone without any cords whatsoever. So gone are the days that you're putting the microphone in and having to plug the cord in. And if you forget to plug the cord in, you have pretty much zero audio. Or if the cord is faulty and the cord's plugged in and you know, there's just no worries. You don't have to worry about a battery going flat and it actually powers directly through the multi-interface shoe. Breathing compensation is a feature that I know a lot of people would want in that Sony a7S 3 and the FX3 and those cameras don't have it, but the FX30 does. Now breathing compensation essentially compensates for the focus breathing yet majority of Sony lenses actually have because they're designed for stills usage and uh, that you don't need to worry about focus breathing when it comes to stills. But uh, when it comes to video, if you're focusing on something close and you focus in the distance, you'll actually see the perspective shift a little bit. And that's just the lens elements trying to, you know, regain focus into a different spot. Some lenses are worse than others, but this corrects for that in camera, which makes it so much easier and you don't have to fix it in post-production. 
Focus mapping is a feature that a lot of people actually don't really use that much, but I use a lot, especially because when I do some top-down shots or when I do product shots, I utilize this to try and see if my focus peaking is actually in the correct spot. So I'll actually, you know, dial it in with my focus peaking and then hit the trash can, which I've programmed it to be focus mapping. And that will give me at least an idea of if it's in focus or out of focus. And then sometimes I'll uh, utilize the zoom function where I can zoom in and just see if it's in focus and then quickly go back to it and hit record and we're all good. Now the sensor in this is a Super 35 sensor, but it is a 6K sensor which down samples to 4K. So down sampling is great because it gives you a much better quality 4K footage and it's just more resolution and uh, you just see a little bit more detail. If you compare it to the A7S III, the FX3, the FX6, they're not as detailed because they're only 12 megapixel sensors, which effectively only gives you about 10 megapixels when you're filming in 16 by nine. This effectively gives you about 20 21 or 20 megapixels when you're filming in that 16 by nine, but it's a very nice quality 4K in comparison to the FX3 and FX6. But in terms of sharpness, in terms of dynamic range, that's when they are different. Price tag, this thing is crazy cheap, sub $2,000, below 2,000 US. That's crazy cheap for all the features that you actually get out of this camera, it's just, it's mind baffling what they've done here. And Super 35, there's absolutely nothing wrong with those kind of sensors. It will suit a certain demographic, it will suit a certain type of people, and it produces an incredible image for that price tag. And when we're talking about Super 35 cameras, lenses are generally cheaper because, well, they cover a smaller surface area. And uh, the great thing is, is they're cheaper so it's more money in our pocket to spend on other things and they're generally lighter as well. So that is a really big benefit. And another big benefit of these lenses is that it has the Sony E-mount, which has incredible amount of options when it comes to native Sony lenses, Sigma lenses, Tamron, and all those other third-party companies produce for this Sony E-mount. You can use full frame lenses on here as well, which is amazing. Now this is a Super 35 sensor. So the crop sensor is actually something that I like because if you do actually need a little bit more reach, I actually use my full frame lenses on here just to give me that little bit of extra reach that I can't normally get with the FX6 or A7 IV. So this could be extremely beneficial for sports and wildlife videographers because if you do have the Sony 200 to 600 lens, that 600 pretty much gets up to 900 millimeters, which is great. If you throw it into 4K, 120 frames per second as well, you pretty much get a 1200 millimeter focal length lens. And that is impressive. And the 22nd reason why I like this camera is that it has the 10-bit codec. Now, Sony have utilized the 8-bit codecs in the Super 35 sensors for absolutely forever. Sure, they had the FS5 and FS7s in the cinema range, which, you know, utilized 10-bit codec in the end, and that's where FX6 and FX9 took over. And they've brought this in this camera and 10-bit is extremely important for color grading and color matching specifically with all the newer cameras and uh, just getting overall better colors from S-Log because uh, S-Log wasn't really as usable as it is now because uh, you've got so much more colors to work with. Now, when it comes to the three downsides that I don't like about this camera, and that is actually one of the pros that I liked about it, but it's also a con and that's 4K 120 frames per second with the crop. Sometimes you don't want to crop. Sometimes you want to be able to use the lens that's on here, throw it into 100 or 120 frames per second and not get a crop, but it does crop in 1.5 times, which can actually throw you out. Then you actually need to find a different lens to suit that same uh, focal length that you actually had before. And if you are shooting real estate or wedding videography and you don't want that real nice punched in style, that's when you have to choose a different lens. It's a little bit annoying and yeah, that kind of sucks. And also when it comes to that 4K, 120 frames per second, 
One of the biggest reasons why I don't like that, it's actually quite noisy. Even if you actually film during the high sunlight, give it as much light as possible without clipping, you still get a noisy image because it's cropping in on the sensor, more of a one-to-one -one readout, which is no longer a 6K sensor that down samples to the 4K. So you're not getting that oversampling, which is squishing the noise. And uh, yeah, unfortunately it's a bit noisy and you do have to be careful of that if you are shooting a low light situation. Uh, because you will notice a lot more noise and you're gonna have to use like neat video or if you're with DaVinci using the noise reduction within DaVinci. And lastly, one of the biggest reasons why I don't like this is actually the highlight roll off. Now the dynamic range isn't as good as the a7 IV and definitely not as good as the FX6. And I do notice that in the highlight roll off. When you're filming some of the skies when they're completely blown out, you can really notice the sky is blown out. But th what I mean by roll off is it goes between the highlights and back uh, to the regular exposed footage. And it doesn't really have a nice smooth transition between those. It's kind of like you're either blown out or you're pretty good. And there's like this hard line where it's you know, completely blown out or not blown out. And yeah, I don't really like that. The FX6 has this beautiful transition between the blown out spots and the non blown out spots. So yeah, unfortunately that's the case because of the lower dynamic range as well. So that pretty much caps off my video of the 22 things that I love about this camera and the three not so nice things about this camera. <laughs> this was a bit of fun video today and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And if you did, give it a thumbs up. That'd be absolutely amazing. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. And uh, thank you to my 70,000 subscribers already. You guys are pretty much what's making this channel happening and keep going and uh, I'll keep producing content for you guys obviously as well uh, but if you aren't subscribed to my channel make sure you subscribe that would be amazing and I'll see you guys in the next one all right let's get it